in the gospel? Yes, commands. When Jesus started out his mission and his ministry, he came issuing commands to faith. What was his foundation message? Mark 1.15, do we keep coming back to this? It's because it's foundational. The kingdom of God is at hand. Wow, fantastic. So repent and believe the good news. Now, the good news is that Christ forgives our sin, puts us right with God by grace and faith alone, isn't it? That's the good news. But what is it that such faith believes? The faith that gets you put right with God by grace through faith alone. What, what, what is it that such faith believes? Such faith trusts, takes God at his word. What is his word? His word is that sin is actually bad. And that it needs repelling and repudiating. Not just letting go of, but pushing out. Booting out. And such faith therefore repents of its sins because that's what it believes. Is that making sense to you? Saving faith says sin's bad, I want, want rid. Such faith repents of its sin. It needs to. It needs to because our God is a holy God. And his fellowship is, is for those who will leave off sinning in order to share a new life with him. We wouldn't have fellowship with sinning, would he? He's the holy God. So the faith that believes what he says and that trusts him leading repentance, well naturally that's, that's the way it's going to go. It's going to relate well to the commandment of God. And that's what Jesus says. If you obey my commands, you'll remain in my love. We looked at remaining in his love. Last time, all the time before? Standing in the spotlight of his love. If you obey me, says Jesus, you obey my commands, you'll remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. Check these three slides to summarize. Jesus does commands. Jesus does obey his Father's commands. So obeying his commands is a matter of following him. And thus, he says, you will remain in my love. Now perhaps there are those around us, perhaps there are those out there somewhere who believe the lies of the sinful for so long, they begin to sound, think this sounds very boring. Begin to sound hard, austere, miserable. And after all, life's hard enough, isn't it? So let's ask this person why we should do this. Why should we do this, obeying his commands, as he has obeyed his father's commands, and staying in his love? Here comes the answer, why? Jesus says, do this, that my joy may be in you. See, the very idea that living for sin's pleasures makes you miserable and glum is an absolute lie of the devil. As is the idea that it leaves you unpopular and unappreciated. You reckon with living not your life but my life, says Jesus, and I'll be taking such great joy in you. That's the first thing. I'll be taking such great joy in you. I've been talking to people just now, as you know, who, who are feeling sort of unappreciated and un unloved and unwanted in their employment situations. Well, you know, what's the worst thing about that? It's, it's the fact that people don't appreciate you, isn't it? Okay, there's all the material stuff that comes with it, like I want to have a job and I want to bring the money in and all the rest of it. But just the way you get treated, so, so much that you're not appreciated. Jesus is saying, hang on, you follow me, I'll take such great joy in you. Think back to what it meant to you as a child, or, or you wished it meant to you as a child, to hear your mum or your dad say, I'm proud of you. Not everyone said that. Some kids have grown up long to hear that. Not everyone said that, not everyone who deserved it, but, but you might remember, some of us do, how much that you frequently long to hear that. And Jesus says this, if your faith leads to repentance and you stick with this lifestyle, then I'll not only be proud of you, but my joy will be. My joy will be in you. Hang on a minute. Um, tell me the answer to this question. Where's Jesus at the moment? Call it. In heaven. In heaven. Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> that's true. I mean, when he says these words, he's, he's, at his last, he's at his last meal, because he's going shortly to his father, going to heaven. So, where is he now? He's, he's in heaven. Jesus has gone to the father. Today, we look around my cell for him. Okay. But today Jesus looks around heaven. 
And he says, if you keep my commandments, my joy is not so much in heaven as my joy will be found wrapped up in you. Sitting in myself. Now that is an astonishing thing for to say, isn't it? How would that be? I told you this so that my joy may be in you. But there's more. We relate to his commandments in the way we've said, because of faith and the repentance it leads to, that my joy may be in you, says Jesus, and so that your joy may be complete joy. If you put your trust in Jesus, and we call this thing faith, and have therefore turned from living for sin to living life following him, because of what you believe, we call this repentance, you're living the life of complete human joy, and your God is rejoicing in you. Now, I know that here every day, all day long, that complete joy lies everywhere else but following Jesus. People tell you those, all those things to sell things to you, perhaps. You know, complete joy lies in this car, or um, that, I can't remember, I don't watch many ads on the television. What do they advertise? I don't know. This is where joy lies. It's marvellous these days, we've got recorded television programmes, you don't get to see so many adverts, do you? Just flick through. Uh, that's a great idea. People tell you joy lies somewhere else to sell stuff to you. People tell you those things to get you to go into things that they are in and feel bad about, but will feel better if they see that you two are doing them with them. Does that make sense? These things will tell you that real joy doesn't lie in following Jesus and obeying his commands. Jesus says, oh yes it does. And then there's non-genuine discipleship with its message. Non-genuine discipleship claims to be genuine discipleship, but it looks as miserable as sin. Do you know why? It's because it is sin. That's why. It poses as discipleship to Christ, but it lives much too close to its own selfish, sinful ambition. And it's even more miserable than honest, upfront, open sinners and sinning can make you. It lives the lie. And it tells you the lie. Non-genuine discipleship tells you this lie, that your obedience to Christ cheapens your life and makes it more miserable. Let's hear Jesus. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I've obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I've told you this in verse 11 of John 15, so that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. You won't find that bit on the telly telling you that, will you? Okay then, for complete joy, what is it, O oh Lord, that you want from us? You're going, leaving your earthly disciples, we get it. We'll be on our own in this band of brothers soon enough now without you, so let's be clear. What is the command that you are giving us? Commands, yes. Why? So that my joy may be in you, joy may be full, got that. What are we to do then, verses 12 to 14? My command is this, he says, He's telling us what now, very clearly. Love each other as I have loved you. Oof. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You're my friends, if you do what I command. Okay, step at a time. Here's what, verse 12. Here's the thing, says Jesus. In case you haven't seen the point of the last three years yet, what you've seen me doing for you in the context of our cosy little band of brothers over the last three years, all that talking and listening and caring and sharing, remember, in our little gospel community, and, and just now when we came in here and your feet were sweaty but nobody made any provision of foot cleansing for our tired, dust, dusty, aching feet, and I saw you were as tired as I was from the journey and bending over the bowl to wash your own feet was going to be a tedious pain in the back for you, you hardened fisherman types from the north, and I took it upon myself to get the towel out and wrap it round me and wash your feet. Do you really think that was all for nothing? Look one another way I've loved you. Jesus has been showing them love for their little gospel community by caring for each other and carrying each other's burdens so as to fulfil the law of Christ. And now, very near the end of the ongoing teaching session on how to live together as a gospel-shaped community conscious of the enormous love and care of God, Jesus says, you've had the demonstration. All of that was very intentional, very purposeful. What you've been having from me was demonstration example, but now I'm going. So here you go. 
love each other as I've loved you. His conduct at the moment has been itself quite descriptive. It portrayed, it described for them the love of their God. And now on the eve of his departure, he says, now this is prescriptive. That's been descriptive. This bit now, we're moving it into the prescriptive realm. Here's what you do. Be sure of this. Be sure you love each other as I have loved you. Why would we say that? Over the last three years, he's observed their varying characters. He's been able to see what is godly and what is ungodly in them. Because that's the human mix. Over the last three years, he's been able to see the way that they've related to one another. He's been able to diffuse flashpoints, moments of impending relational crisis. The man's going away. He says, look. The way you've seen me relating to you and dealing with you, that's been descriptive of the love of God and the service of God to you. Now this is prescriptive. Be sure now that as I'm going, you love each other as I've loved you. He's going to need to say more about how. So here's where that comes from. Here's how. We've had here's what. Here's how, verse 13. Greater love has no one amiss that he lays down his life for his friend. The Lord's commandment is to love, okay? And here's how you do it. You lay down your life for your friends. Who are the friends in this context? Firstly, there are the disciples. Jesus is talking about his own love, which sets the agenda for the rest of us. Now you're going to love your friends. Easy to forget, isn't it, in modern Western Christianity, that discipleship means following. We're following what he's done already, and actually we're following a crucified Messiah who is soon going to lay down his life for them as he speaks. And he calls them friends. Firstly, there are the disciples. He lays down his life for his friends. There's Jesus. So secondly, then, there are these other disciples who are laying down their lives for one another, or to do so. There's the towel incident. There's the example of all the loving, caring, sharing of the last three years of ministry. And they're going to have to learn to keep this up in his absence. Peter, you're going to have to help. James and John. Serve, love, care. Peter, James, John, Matthew, tax collector. And we also have him. Not a type. Thomas? Oh, Johnny, nice, isn't he? He's always dithering, isn't he? And always, oh, I'm not sure. Do you know all those people? <laughs> You'll always get somebody in your church who's, who's, who's health and safety. You know? You'll always get somebody like that. That's great, they're supposed to be that. I love them, Mother says Jesus, the way I love them. You always get somebody like Peter who's all math and fast action. Oh dear. <laughs> well, I see that now. I love one another, says Jesus, the way I've loved you. And keep this up in my absence. Whatever your natural differences, which are many, you'll have to lay down your lives for one another. And then second, uh, thirdly, they're the friends of Jesus now, verse 14, and all of them are going to lay down their lives eventually for him. They lay down their life for Jesus, their friends. Either from scripture or from fairly reliable tradition, once Judas has left the room, those early disciples were so convinced, so transformed by the power of the love of Jesus Christ in their life, they will live the rest of it and lay down the rest of it in serving him and it will end in death. That is how to stay in his love. That is how to be his joy. That is how to live in the complete joy that Christ gives. Because half-hearted, non-genuine disciples of Jesus are not happy people. Laying down your life for your friends because he laid down his life for you, who he's made into his friend. And there's more to it than that. We've seen there's commands, we've seen there's why, we've seen there's what, we've seen here's what, we've seen here's how. Here is what actually authenticates genuine following of Jesus. Verse 14. You are my friends. How will we know if we're his friends? You are my friends if you do what I command, he says. That's what authenticates. Save in faith, but right with God by grace through faith alone. It's the living in the light of his command, in the repentance that stems from faith. Not perfectly, not without the need to go back to his, his uh, saving grace and his infinite mercy day by day. But that's the way we're heading and living now. And that's the difference it makes. 
So, that's a picture of Luther, by the way, if you wonder. No more Luther. No more salvation by grace through faith alone. <laughs> Where does that clash with the idea of, of grace-based salvation, or I've just been saying to you? I was going to have a whole second heading here when I started preparing, having opened up the text, just sorted out what it was saying. I was going to deal with the problem it raises of keeping commandments being the authenticating element of grace-based salvation. So that's why I put up here the clash with grace-based salvation, but it doesn't clash. It doesn't clash. Because faith is God's gift, which, when you believe the facts he teaches and trusts the one who is speaking, that faith leads to repentance. And simply because we've come to believe that what he says is true and right, and what we've been acting on is false and wrong, faith fruits in repentance. What we repent from is living in defiance of his commandments. God says, and I don't want to know. We repent of that. That's what sin is, isn't it? We repent of that. And what we repent into from that is, is trusting him. And however feebly, and however much we depend on fresh forgiveness each day, which we need to do, we therefore keep his commands. Because we love him. And we're glad of him. And we're grateful for him. So there is no clash between keeping his commandments and being saved by grace through faith alone. The opposite is in fact the case. It's an apparent clash, which doesn't really exist. Genuine discipleship, and we've been looking in the last weeks at the genuine Jesus and moving on to look at genuine discipleship. Genuine discipleship is characterized by the faith that leads to repentance and that follows Jesus into the radical and world-changing area of loving one another. Not niggling and striving and nitpicking each other, but loving one another the way he said we should. Now that's a huge challenge. But it's also a huge practical part of the life and challenge of genuine discipleship. And huge tranches of Welshmen and Welsh women see nothing but inauthentic discipleship. And on the basis of what they see, reject the course of genuine discipleship to the genuine Jesus and pass into the world. That's how important it is. That's how important it is to be building authentic gospel communities that demonstrate something else. I can't imagine that Jesus won't have a lot to say on that subject and on the day that he returns in glory. I wonder whether maybe it's time to, to abandon the category chapel and embrace loving, living, life-shaping gospel community in obedience to his word and in response to the people we hear to serve.